Welcome to this new video. This is about chapter 12, the design of the tax system, and we are going to try to solve the problems in application from 6 to 9. Remember, this is a book of Gregory Mankiw, Principles of Economics, 7th edition. So the sixth, the sixth question says, uh, when someone owns an asset, such as a share of a stock that rises in value, is what we call that he has an accrued capital gain. If he sells the asset, he realizes the gains that have previously accrued. Under the U.S. income tax system, realized capital gains are taxed, but accrued gain are not. So the first question that the text proposes to us is explain explain how individuals behavior is affected by this rule so basically we need to we need first to understand these two uh, concepts the first one is accrued income accrued income is basically the difference from purchase price to current price but you don't sell this stock or this asset so is what we call the the is not realized this sell or this gain is not realized so in this in this case for example you buy for a, you bought uh, an apple stock from ten dollars and then currently the accurate value is 15 so it means that this gain of five dollars is the money that you have gained, but you did you haven't sold yet this asset. So for this reason, is not still realized. And the other part, the capital gain is is um, instead of keeping the asset, you sell that. So when you realize the real value, is in this time when this is going to be tax. Then the idea, how affect this this rule? Basically, on um, first instance, it discourages people speculate with the assets because when you buy and sell at the same day, you are not thinking only on the gain for the purchasing and selling part but also you need to take into account the cost of transaction including inside that the tax so definitely something that is going to be a gain it, it won't be anymore due to you need to pay taxes so for this reason it's um, it's that the fact then the B part says some economists believe that cutting capital gains tax rates, especially temporary ones, can raise tax revenue. How might this be so? Basically, the idea is like it could be that due to uh, we can consider that this kind of market is really inelastic. So demand and supply is really inelastic so it means that due to changes in prices the quantities they don't vary as much as the prices did then when we have this fact uh, at the end what we will uh, face is a dead weight uh, smaller so we have here a dead weight uh, dead weight loss should be smaller and remember in elastic market so in this case uh, when for example we have that um, this is going to be the size of the tax so this triangle is going to be the dead weight loss so it's going to be the efficiency that's going to be lost so in this time due to the quantities they don't vary too much so from this point to this point is not going to be a huge uh, change so due to this fact we can uh, conclude that maybe could be the case that can raise the tax revenue then do you think it is a good rule to tax realized but not accrued capital gains? Why or why not? 
So basically we have two facts here. Uh, we have one positive as everything in economics it depends. So for example, the positive fact is that it, it avoids in some way speculators because speculators they can just look for uh, fast rapid uh, gains so then we can avoid this kind of the market and all the market, all the prices that are going to be generated by real um, real participants uh, within the market. So at this time people start to see the investment in the long run. So they're going to be more uh, kind of safer, this kind of investment and they won't depend more on the changes in the short run. The negative part basically what we have here is that it makes the market less attractive because at the end they move, they have at least they provide liquidity to the market. So when they need to pay taxes, what they are going to face at this time they're going to avoid these kind of markets because they would they will pay a tax. And then, uh, as, as a matter of fact, we can conclude that it's going to be a less dynamic in short run due to the transactions cost. So, this to this fact, there's going to be more people that there's going to be, uh, they're not going to be more encouraged in order to participate inside the market. Then, the seventh part says, Suppose that your state raises its sales tax from 5% to 6%. Then the state revenue commissioner forecasts a 20% increase in sales tax revenue. Is this possible? Explain. So basically, according to our uh, chapter 8, you can have a look to my video, my, my, my channel. And you will find the the chapter eight when we include and we analyze about the government policies inside the market, and at the end uh, it could be possible depending on the shape of revenue. At the end we know that this is going to be like kind of a bell, the tax revenue we have here the y-axis the tax revenue, and here we have the tax. The idea of each government is not because they tax more, the percentage, they're going to have more revenue because people, they don't buy more. So in this, they're going, they going to discourage the transactions inside the market. As well, if they charge just a low part, at this time the revenue is not going to be again. So it's going to be kind of... Um, we could say kind of concave curve, it means immediately it has a maximum. So it has a maximum, so it's going to be this value. So it's going to be like shaped by a function that you can find the maximum value over here. So imagine that we are talking about 5% is this one and 6% is this one. Definitely, if we can to if we can consider the slope of this curve, we can figure out that this change from five to six is going to represent an increase uh, of twenty percent. So imagine this is going to be one hundred dollars just for saying something, and this one is going to be one hundred twenty dollars. So it could be the case. It won't. If we are over here, definitely an increase, it will decrease less. Or maybe if another part is going to be a different slope. So it depends in which part of this curve we are. But definitely this is plausible. Then uh, the eighth point says the Tax Reform Act of 19. 86 eliminated the deductibility of interest payments on consumer debt, mostly credit cards and auto loans, but maintained the deductibility of interest payments on mortgage and home equity loans. What do you think happened to the relative amounts of borrowing through consumer debt and home equity debt? Well, actually, it's going to be kind of the immediate answer because uh, with the credit cards and auto loans, uh, if you have a deductible, um, it means uh, you don't need to pay the interest. So it, 
this kind of policy to encourage people to ask for these credit cards and auto loans. So definitely it will increase the consumer debt. And on the other part, on the other side, we have the home equity debt. Um, and actually something to think about it. It's not kind of immediate because you have two points of view. The first one, you would say, okay, the tax is higher, so you need to pay tax for that. So definitely it will decrease. But, but on the other side, uh, they have like different factors. So for example, uh, when someone is going to buy a home, uh, maybe something decision of once in life. So for this fact, maybe it's kind of inelastic to the decision. So for this reason, maybe anyway, they will ask for that law, that loan. On the other side, we need to take into account the interest rate, not only the tax, but also the interest rate, because compared with the tax that you need to pay, imagine that the interest rates, they are low at this time. So it depends actually, but I would say that it's almost the same, but uh, trend, it could be like kind of a little bit lower, people maybe they think about waiting a little bit in order to ask for that loan. Then. Uh, the ninth part, uh, the last one, it says, categorize each of the following funding schemes and examples of the benefits principle or the ability to pay principle. Remember, basically, what we say the benefits principle is basically you pay because you use it. So you go to a park and you pay a tax, just the people that they pay they they go to this park is what we call the benefits principle so because you are getting or you're taking advantage of this public good of this good at the end you need to pay for that in some way with the taxes then the ability to pay principle basically just even if you don't directly you you, you have the benefits for this good of service you need to pay just because you have a higher income than other people in order to support these service. Then, uh, the first one, visitors to many national parks pay an entrance fee, so it would be the benefit principle. Why? Because you are taking advantage of the park, so definitely you need to pay for the entrance of that. Then, local property taxes support elementary and secondary school, definitely a local property they don't have any like direct relation with this kind of elementary and secondary schools, but due to the ability to pay principal, they need to provide these taxes. And the last one, an airport trust funds collects a tax and on each plane ticket sold and uses the money to improve airports and air traffic controls. Definitely the benefit principle because the income of this tax is going to be uh, invested or is going to be uh, spent in the same field. So I hope it's worth uh, as I said in uh, every video, it's just my point of the view, it's not like the the real truth, but uh, is how I answer these kind of questions. If you have any doubts, any suggestions, anything that you think could be better, I really appreciate that and we can build our answers together. So please have a great day. See you the next video. Bye-bye.